video game creepypastas. Most aren't good, let's be honest. Either the main character is an idiot, there's all this hyper-realistic blood, or the writer just can't use paragraph breaks. However, the one game series I feel has the best collection of creepypastas has to be Pokemon, mostly because all there is to work with, especially all those Pokedex entries, and uh, you know, there's been a new leak recently, yeah I heard about that, it's a bit messed up. Now, a lot are pretty bad. Check out Yuri of Wind's channel to see for yourself. But there are some real diamonds in the rough. Out of all the spooky urban legends and creepypastas related to Pokemon, none has scared me and interested me more than Pokemon Lost Silver. So, sit back and get comfy, because for this Halloween night, let's revisit it a decade later and see if it's as bone chilling as it was long ago. Real fast, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, because if I did, this would be an hour long video probably, and I don't have the patience for that. I'm instead just gonna summarize it, while footage of a fan made game of it plays in the background. Around the time of Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver's release, the narrator, a college student, can't afford to game upon a release. By the end of his semester, he's able to order a copy from Amazon. Yet, it won't arrive for weeks. He decides to replay Gen 2 during the wait. However, his mother had thrown away all his old Pokemon games since their batteries had died. Which sounds a lot like my mom, only with mine it was because she fought through a cause demon possession and stuff because the pastor told her so, but that's beside the point. Anyway, he decided to go to GameStop to buy a used copy of Pokemon Silver. A few things about this strike me as odd. First is the fact that this copy sold for 10 bucks. Were Pokemon games really that cheap in 2010? Plus, this is GameStop, so... Also, this story was written at a time when GameStop stopped selling GBC games, but before they began selling them again as retro in the mid-2010s, I think. Something like eBay would have worked a lot better as a plot device. That's all I'm saying. Those plot holes aside, he gets the game, goes home, and begins to play it. Weird things happen from the very start. From having difficulties getting the game to start up, to the game beginning not at the title screen, but on a previous save file. Whoever this previous owner was, he sure played the crap out of it, having all 251 Pokemon, max money, all badges, and having spent over a thousand hours in-game. In the author thinks that whoever had it beforehand either cheated or was a hardcore Pokemon fan. But, as Yuri of Wind said in his video, if you spend that much time in a game, you have moved on from being a hardcore fan into just insanity. Look, I know there are a lot of people who have legit reached that clock out limit, uh, Chugga Conroy being one of them, but I just can't imagine spending that much time in a game. If you are a person who has, well, I have a lot of respect for you. Respect, but uh, I still think you're at least a little crazy. Anyway, oddly enough, his Pokemon team sucked ass, consisting of five unknowns and a Cyndaquil named Hurry. The unknown spelt leave as well. If it was me who got this game, I probably wouldn't even notice this since I usually have no idea which unknowns correspond with which letters. The Cyndaquil was only level 5, had 1 HP left, and only 2 moves, Leer and Flash. He appeared to be in Bellsprout Tower, only there's no one else around, and the pillar didn't move like it normally does. After a few minutes, the narrator finds an exit behind the pillar. This exit led to a black room, with the radio static in the ruins of ALF playing, which is one of the creepiest songs in Pokemon. Honestly, I feel like it's creepier than Lavender Town. Uh, it, 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 yeah, this, this song freaks me the fuck out most of the time. Anyway, he used Flash to light the room, only to see everything was blood red. He began heading south, and as he did so, the room became darker and darker, before reaching a sign, saying turn back now. Then the dialogue box popped up, asking yes or no. The narrator picked yes, causing the screen to turn black again, 
and a polka flute theme to play. Using Flash again to light the room caused Hurry to faint. Alarmed, he checks his Pokemon, only to find that his team is different, now being six unknowns, spelling he died. This room looked to be a grave site, like Pokemon Tower from Lavender Town in Gen 1. Gold's arms now appeared to be missing, and his expression changed, looking less smug and more empty. His character then began to spin, and he fell down into another room. Gold was now colorless, like a sprite from the original Game Boy games, thrown into a Gen 2 game as the author says. Checking his trainer card, Gold dons his most iconic look of this creepypasta. His legs are gone too, being a floating torso, his skin is white, his eyes are now gaping holes, with blood seeping out of them. His team changed once again, to five unknowns and a Celebi. This time the unknown spelt out, dying. The Celebi meanwhile was shiny, yet only half the sprite appeared to be there, and it only had one move, Parashong. This new area, once again, looks similar to Bellsprout Tower, only with an eerie red glow. The narrator walks north, until he comes across sprites of other characters. They too appeared white and colorless. He tried speaking to them, but couldn't. He continues his walk, only to come across red. He's in even worse shape than gold, being transparent. The two then face off in a Pokemon battle. Despite having a whole team of unknowns, the only Pokemon gold throughout was a Celebi, while red throws out his Pikachu. This Pikachu was different, looking sad with tears in his eyes. Also, it was level 255, as if fighting Red wasn't hard enough as it is. Celebi used Parasong, and both Pokemon fainted after three turns. Only they didn't. They died. Somehow, the player is victorious. But, when Red's sprite shows up again, he's headless this time. When the battle ends, he finds himself in Gold's room in Newbark. He checks out his team, this time, the unknown spell out no more. If being limbless and having bloody eye sockets wasn't bad enough already, Gold has been reduced to only his head. Transparent skin and his eyes have become an even deeper void. He explores the house, hoping to be able to play the game normally now, but deep down, he knew that he wouldn't be able to. Downstairs, Gold's mother wasn't home, which is probably a good thing. The last thing a mother wants to see is her son as a transparent floating head with bleeding eyeballs, or what used to be eyeballs. He leaves the house into a dark void. Gold's sprite becomes white to contrast against the darkness. He kept going south until he came across a sprite, Gold's old normal sprite. It said, goodbye forever. After this, something used Nightmare, and what was left of the player began another descent downwards. He was back in the graveyard area, with no sprite in the overworld. In a trainer card, gold disappeared as well, and in the place of gym badges were skulls. Once again, a new team of unknowns were in his possession, spelling, I'm dead. Gold had presumably died a premature death, and despite his accomplishments, was ultimately forgotten. I mean, that's basically how the fanbase remembered Gold or Ethan or whatever you want to call him anyway. Depending on how you interpret game lore, he surpassed Red, plus the Gen 2 games and the remakes are so many people's favorite games in a series, yet Gold is somehow kind of forgotten. Anyway, the author tried to reset the game, only to end up in the same grave again and again. Eventually he gives up, waits for Soul Silver to arrive, and has a great time with it. The end. Now, as far as video game creepypastas go, that was pretty good, mostly because of one element. It's slightly believable. There's no supernatural elements to the piece. The author says again and again that he believes it's a hack game, or a fan game, mistakenly sold at GameStop. It's much different than, let's say, something that involves haunted games or curses or someone getting murdered or going crazy. 
The imagery works rather well too, even if it is a little cliché. Gold's body becoming more and more unnerving, unknown spelling hidden messages, along with utilizing already creepy aspects of these old games. At least, I always thought Bellsprout Tower was freaky, I can't be the only one, can I? Soon after the creepypasta was written, a fan game was made of it, which is what I played to, to get footage for this video. There are multiple versions and revisions of it, with alternate endings and the like, and it's very well made, bringing the author's story to life perfectly. The sprite work is great, and it's way freakier than just reading a story by itself. As for my personal experiences with this story, well, my first experience with it was when I was 12. It was a good couple of years after it came out, around 2015 or so, and I came across Yuri of Wind's video on it, which is a pretty good video, and I recommend you watch it. Anyway, it freaked me out a ton, especially the image of gold as a floating torso of bloody tears. Like I said earlier, it's the most iconic moment of lost silver, being the main focus of countless fan art. Despite being freaked out, I always imagined how cool it would be to be in a state, going around my school and scaring the daylights out of the kids who used to pick on me. The creepypastas of the Pokemon franchise were as well some of my first exposures to the series, after the Smash series, and hearing about how demonic and evil it was from various people throughout my life, which probably made me view these stories as even creepier than they actually were. Lavender Town Syndrome, Lost Silver, Creepy Black, we all came together to create this sense of mysteriousness and wonder. When I finally got to play the series as a teenager, this feeling went away, replaced with love of Pokemon. Part of me still misses the days, where a simple tale like Lost Silver was enough to leave a big impact on me. Alas, sadly, they are long gone. If you liked the video, be sure to like, subscribe, and maybe even check out some other videos I've made on the Pokemon franchise. I have a whole playlist right here. And if you have stories on your own about Lost Silver, tell me in the comments. I hope you all have a great Halloween, and with that, I'll see you all later.